Fellow Travelers explores the links between wanted power and forbidden love. It chronicles the decades-long romance of Washington, D.C., Hawk and Tim, who are compelled to keep their relationship a secret. As a story about the harm that McCarthyism did on innocent people and the people who loved them, that chapter of this historical epic had to end. The brilliant writers of the show can only so many times shift the focus of their central couple until the strategies start to feel formulaic and like ploys to drag out the story in order to fit an episode order. Since five of the eight episodes in this plot revolved around the red and lavender scares, it was risky that the McCarthy era would drag the show down. Fortunately, the last episode, which takes place in the 1950s, clears the slate, but not before leaving blood on everyone's hands with a few unexpected and incredibly depressing turns. McCarthy's regime is about to an end, but before everything falls apart, a citywide crackdown is carried out on subversives, and the public is still in favor of getting rid of these so-called abnormals. Hawk searches for his senator employer Wesley Smith's son, Leonard Smith, Mike Taylor, who hasn't been home in the past two nights. Since Hawk identifies with Leonard's lack of intimacy with his father, he asks his underworld connections in Washington, D.C., to contact him if Leonard shows up at any of Hawk's preferred cruise locations. But it's too late now. The cozy corner, Hawk, Tim, and Marcus' favorite hangout, is raided by the authorities for the first time in the series, and the city is teeming with police officers. Though I don't think I was anticipating this, I still believe it was long overdue. A multi-story hangout for drag queens, drag kings, and queer folks of all kinds that wasn't being raided more frequently has been bothering me as a significant plot hole, because the cozy corner is a fictionalized version of a genuine bar even if the bar owners were possibly bribing cops to stay away. When Leonard is discovered filleting another man in the restroom during the raid, Hawk is thrust into an entirely new realm of difficulties. Although Leonard's arrest has not been reported by any Washington newspapers, it won't be long before one of McCarthy's allies obtains his arrest transcript. Hawk is enraged and becomes tired of having to be the stereotypical straight guy and chastise Leonard. There is just an hour until dawn when he returns to his apartment. However, Tim is not expelled as he would have been several months earlier despite dozing off while waiting for Hawk to return. Rather, Hawk curls up in Tim's arms as they relish the brief moments of intimacy before they go back to their regular lives. Tim says Hawk in bed, you know, you've been rather sweet lately. However, Hawk's warmth is limited to his romantic partner, and when it comes to handling the fallout from Leonard's sins on Senator Smith's career, he becomes cold and merciless. In the Army McCarthy hearings, the senator plays a key player, questioning McCarthy, Roy Kahn, and David Shine about the abuse of their subcommittee's authority. It comes as no surprise that McCarthy's political friends don't waste any time in threatening the senator with the crimes of his son. Smith is given a warning. Either step down from your position or they'll reveal Leonard's deviation. However, Leonard's arrest record hasn't been located yet, so in the absence of solid proof, Senator Smith is limited to lying to his blackmailers and promising to support McCarthy in the Senate if necessary, even if it means voting against his expulsion. It's an attempt to buy time, but the time is running out. Lenny gets a final jab at his father before the Smiths send Leonard off to conversion therapy in the meantime. He informs him, whatever disgusting thing I am, you make me this way, seemingly referring to the fact that Wesley chose to prioritize Hawk above his own son. When Hawk interacts with the chief physician at the Conversion Therapy Institution, he is reassured that aversion therapy plus electric shock therapy has been shown to be effective in certain situations. The doctor informs Hawk, it's a small price to pay to be sane and happy. It's difficult not to hope that Hawk will act morally and allow Leonard to escape to another location, averting this terrible fate. However, Hawk intensifies the brutality that is anticipated of him. Leonard remembers the first summer Hawk spent with their family when they went camping and got wasted and masturbated together. This is before Leonard joins the clinic's prison. According to Hawk, normal men grow out of that. All boys do that. When Leonard admits that he considered telling his father about Hawk in an attempt to exact revenge, Hawk lashes out in return. About what? Some depressing, twisted fantasy you conjured up in your deviant mind. In reference to contortion, McCarthy has been making an effort, albeit an unsuccessful one to allay any doubts over the character of his association with Conan Shine. He is able to dispute the courts, but it is more difficult for him to dispute his own wife, Jen Kerr, Christine Horn, who has a beard. Raising an eyebrow, Jean asks her husband why he continues to support Roy, because Roy allowed their once brave ship to capsize. 
What is he holding against you? Unaware that Roy is threatening McCarthy with evidence of the senator's inebriated sodomization of another man, Jean asks. McCarthy answers, you would think a man from Wisconsin would know how to get his wife pregnant. Jean snaps back, men from Wisconsin don't turn on their friends. If only this show, rather than Drag Race, were performed in bars every Friday. But things soon get gloomy once more. To inform Lucy, Allison Williams, that the Republican senators have located Leonard's jail record. Senator Smith calls her into his study. The arrest record will either be made public or Wesley will completely resign from office and be replaced with a Republican, who will almost certainly vote in support of McCarthy and maybe maintain him in power. What chance will Lenny have to live a normal life, even if he's cured, when he comes out of that hospital? His daughter is asked by Senator Smith, it will be my fault. I will have destroyed him twice, and this will haunt him for the rest of his days. Whatever happens, Lucy attempts to tell her father that everything will be all right. However, things have quickly gotten out of hand, and Smith is unable to imagine a scenario in which he forfeits a lifetime of fighting for justice in order to keep his son safe, nor is he willing to injure Leonard further than he has already. The senator goes to his office the following day, writes a letter of resignation, tucks a gun beneath his mouth, and pulls the trigger. The characters of fellow travelers spend a significant amount of this episode attempting to navigate one of the show's most recurring themes, truth, or, more precisely, how a town like Washington, D.C., twists the reality to fit whatever greater story is being told there. The weight of Lenny's reality is what really seems to impose on Wesley before he kills himself, but the truth about Leonard ruins his father's life in almost no time at all. It is impossible to bear the knowledge that his son would suffer tremendous agony and mental anguish as a result of his reckless decisions if he doesn't step down. As he is aware that his failure to locate the arrest record before anybody else had a part in Wesley's suicide, Hawk also accepts a silent degree of responsibility. Now it is ineffective to send Leonard to conversion treatment merely to maintain face, and Hawk's unwillingness to show Lenny compassion may have ended the lives of yet another Smith family member. Hawk is aware of his toxic nature and how it poisons everyone around him, even Tim, with his dance between reality and illusion. Tim is informed by Hawk that he will be proposing to Lucy, and the two men share their final evening together. Tim informed Hawk that he was leaving because the only way to break free from their toxic relationship was to enlist in the Air Force and resign from McCarthy's office. Tim says, I have to move on from you. Hawk nods in agreement, understanding that everything in his path would end in ruin. This is their opportunity to put things right between them and serves as a springboard for fellow travelers to fulfill its promise to show us how these loves reunite throughout the ensuing decades.